Well, hi, I'm Belinda Glenn, and I'm here with John Hayacek. And he is, I'll actually let him introduce himself. He is a historian of Mormon history, um, but other history as well. But I'll let you introduce yourself. Well, what I do is I specialize in Mormon history, but I put Mormon history in the context of early American religions. And so I'm studying the origins of the Latter-day Saint movement, which of course starts in 1830 or 1820, when Joe Smith describes his first vision. But I'm going much farther back. I go back into England to um, about 1612. Okay. And then the Smith family came from England from... from Your area of expertise goes back to 1612? Yes. Okay. So, I, well, in a small way. We're looking at uh, the origins of the Smith family and what kind of experiences uh, they had that might influence how they came into the restoration movement and how they started the Latter-day Saint Church. Okay. So we have to go back and we have to look at uh, the towns in Lincolnshire, England, where the Smiths came from, which is near Boston in England. So the Smith, the emigrant Smith ancestor, Robert Smith, came to uh, Boston and New England in okay. 1638. And that's okay. actually important. Gotcha. So there's a story there. It would take a book to explain it. Okay. And then the Smiths live in Massachusetts Bay Colony in Massachusetts for uh, five generations. And then they wow. migrate to Vermont. Okay. And that the story then becomes v increasingly important. And the Smiths then spend 25 years in Vermont from uh, 1791 until 1816. And they go up into Palmyra, New York. Okay. Most Mormon historians start their history in 1816 with the arrival mm -hmm. of the Smith family in New York, but that's not my story. My story starts way back in 16, in 1216, but especially in about 1791 when the Smiths arrive in Vermont. In the U.S., mm -hmm. which I have well, to... Not, right, right. Uh, is that, that's what you mean? Well, they arrived in their... the U.S. in 1638, uh, but they get, then come up to Vermont in, six, in oh. uh, 1791, and the Mormon history really starts okay. for me in 1791. But I want to okay. still know what... Uh, what was driving the Smiths, what made them different from any other family, whether mm -hmm. one believes that they created and crafted the Book of Mormon or whether or not mm -hmm. they were gifted by God, why was that family chosen to do this incredible work? Okay, so that, that gives me two questions is one, um, why are you, because cause you are not LDS or Mormon Correct. yourself and never have been. Well, no, I think I'm LDS and Mormon and nobody else is. Okay, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I mean, everybody else is, but I okay. mean... Okay, <laughs> you're... I, I see Mormonism in a broader context, so it's more of the uh, American religious experience, and um, especially when Joseph Smith was killed in 1844, the church fragmented into many mm -hmm. uh, smaller groups, especially six large branches, mm -hmm. and the followers of Brigham Young that came to Utah were the largest branch, and um, they were several other branches that in many ways were more significant than that branch. Even though that was larger, about a third of the church um, followed a man named James Strang, and they went up to Wisconsin and Michigan from Illinois. Oh, I have vaguely so heard about that's that. that's my yeah. background. But what drew you to this since you are not... So I grew I up would, on a... Okay. Yeah, so I grew up on a road called Mormon Road. Okay. And you would say I'm not Mormon, but I grew up on a road called Mormon Road okay. in a historic ghost town, a settlement from the 1830s and 1840s. Okay. Um, that was essentially a, an, outpost in, from, an outpost from Nauvoo. Okay. And my Although friends- Although it had been an LDS community. In the 1840s especially, and then, right. It was founded in 1835 uh, by the direction of Joseph Smith Sr. Mm -hmm. and then uh, continued to about 1856, but Mormons survived there and so when I was in high school, when I was 16, 17, and 18, my best friends were 66 through 96 years old. Okay. And so I, when my friends were out drinking, I would just walk down Mormon Road and knock on doors and go visit with elderly people. And really? that kind of started with me being a snow shoveler. Starting when I was about okay. 11, yeah. I made my living shoveling snow. Okay. And it, and I was, in, I was in Minnesota at that time, and we got a lot of snow. And it, uh, I, it didn't take me long to realize that the people that I was shoveling snow for who were elderly shut-ins, 
needed more than their snow shovel, they would insist on me coming in and having milk and yeah. hot chocolate and cookies or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they wanted me to stay. And mm-hmm. so I, I listened to their stories and I actually grew a genuine appreciation for the, the knowledge and wisdom that they had to share. That's very, that is a very so, unique young man yeah. that would do that at that yeah. age and, and appreciate what they had to say and want to spend time to do that. And yeah. that, I guess that's a historian side of you. You're interested in those stories. And right, right. So then we moved to Wisconsin. And so that was when I was 11, shoveling snow. We moved to Wisconsin, and I continued the same thing. I went to visit the, the Mormons there. And these Mormons were, they were the grandchildren, not the great-grandchildren, the great-great-grandchildren. These were the grandchildren of people that had lived in Nauvoo with Joseph Smith. No and way. lived in Palmyra, and they had books, like I've what? brought here today. I've never and they, heard about this. Ang- and they I've shared. Never... And so I got brought into their inner circle. They didn't okay. know any young people. Okay. They brought me into this inner secretive circle. <laughs> secretive of, circle? <laughs> and told me the secrets of Mormonism. <gasps> oh, my goodness. From Nauvoo that aren't known even in Utah. So. Yeah, I've never heard of this. I grew up Mormon. I've never heard of this right. at all. And then they, you know, they ordained me when I was 18. Oh, oh! They were a practicing group. They're a practicing that had group of preserved Mormons, it right? This whole time. they preserved a different okay. tradition of Mormonism than has been okay. preserved out in Utah. Oh, wow. So it's okay. a, it's the, the, an outside the box view of Mormonism mm-hmm. that's uh, that's equally authentic and genuine and mm-hmm. has you know a, vali- a valid story. Yeah. So they brought me into this, and they you know I mean and, and then it went on for years, for decades. For my best friend was ninety six when he died. He was sixty six when I met him. Okay. <laughs> and and these folks, you know, designated me to be their archivist and their historian and their and to carry on much of what they were doing. Very. And he was 66 and you were how old? When 18. you were best friends. Yeah, 18. That is very unique. <laughs> yeah. And so he became my mentor and he was a okay. and he was married to the granddaughter of of uh, somebody that lived in Palmyra with Joseph Smith. Wow. And, and so that is amazing. I think we forget how close are we are even now to these generations, you right. know? I mean, so much has changed. Me talking to my grandmother alone and her upbringing was so different. It's just like a different world practically. Mm-hmm. So that's, yeah, of course, you know, that so really Latter-day, wasn't that many generations before. Yeah, exactly. And so Latter-day Saints out in Utah would say, maybe John isn't a Mormon, but mm-hmm. I actually have three people between me, my ordination, when I was 18, there's three people between me and and a man ordained by Joseph Smith. So it's very short, wow. you know, the time So you are the a, most Mormon Mormon. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's why people call me the last Mormon, right. But I'm and, not. I mean, that's just a... And now you're especially the last Mormon because they've changed the policy to, that where, where the church wants to be called LDS instead right. of more... Actually, they right. want to be called Latter-day, Latter-day Saints. Saints. Right. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, mm-hmm. members of the church, anyway, instead of Mormons. So, But they have a problem. They had to name their website churchofjesuschrist.org mm-hmm. because I own the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.org. No, you don't. Yes. So how did that happen? And you never, you never mm-hmm. gave that they up. They didn't think to buy it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love this. And you, you not, no matter how much they offered you, you weren't willing to, you didn't... Oh, I haven't offered it to them. It's not for sale, but and they haven't asked to buy it. They haven't asked? No. Oh, I would have thought they would ask. They just picked another one. They just picked another one. Oh, okay. That's funny. So and I have you... some other good ones. I have mormonism.com, which is the okay. longest r- continuously running website on Mormonism on the Internet. Mormonism.com. Oh. I started in, um, okay. in uh, 1996, in December of okay. 1996. And all the other yeah. sites that there were a couple that preceded me, apparently Mormon and Mormons, because I picked Mormonism because it was the third best name okay. I could get. And <laughs> Mormon and Mormon is Mormon and Mormons have changed since then, so mine has yeah. been running continually. And LDS is no is no longer LDS.org, so that changed and Wow, that was way I before I forgot the, my little website. Right before <laughs> the curb, nineteen ninety six. Perfect yep. timing. So you use that website for your histor- historian? I have um, about um, 1,250 websites. So oh. that's the that's the one I started. It hasn't okay. changed much since 1996. It's just there. Okay. But okay. So you don't. You're not saying you actively use all of these, but no, they're not active. I'm actually. Like... I actually have plans for every one of them where I'm okay. developing um, oh. a different 
each one will eventually contain a, an article on Mormon history. Oh, okay. With its own name. So you got into this because you you had this unique background, and mm -hmm. your family was not not Mormon or LDS when you moved when you moved to this area. Right. And so you yourself got in, you know, got involved in this on your own accord. Right. So I was baptized when I was eighteen. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is such a unique story. I still think it's my heritage, though. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's my, it's my adopted heritage. So, and so do you think you would have gone into history if you hadn't had this? Do you think history is just something you are passionate about either way? It's like a talent. Saying it's a gift might be a little too far, but it's, I'm particularly talented at it. I was just good at it. And okay. when, I, when I say that, I mean the different parts of what I do, like discovering and acquiring and uh, the restoration process, the um, sharing part, and the and even the financial parts, and eventually finding uh, the correct place to, pla to place these items are all, are all skills that I think I was fortunate and had. Mm -hmm. um, and in its philanthropic for me, and you can do a lot of things philanthropically. I could go work at a homeless shelter. I, there's things you can do where you can use your resources in other ways, but this, I do this because I'm particularly good at it, and maybe nobody else could fill that void. Okay. And so it's something that you really fit in because your talents are in that right. area, but you also love it, which right. is a good. But I didn't go to school for that. So even in the okay. midst of all of that early experience that I had in the 1980s and 1990s, I went to school for business and grad school for business and economics mainly. So you got your degree and you get out of college and you're, gonna, you're like, I should go get a job. What? Oh yeah, I, I started a little publishing company as a grad student reprinting rare Mormon books from okay. the 1830s and 1940s. Okay. And so I was providing reprints and I was using university support, university printing, which I had to pay for, but it was all supported for me to produce these rare books and then sell them to all the college and research libraries in the country. Oh, And then okay. eventually I sold that company and then, I, and then I continued to collect the rare books. So I guess I, guess I wanna know what then, you know, this experience growing up with this group where, so you were exposed to this group in near Nauvoo as opposed to being exposed to the Utah group, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I come from an international family, so I actually wasn't familiar with the Utah thing until I was in high school either, <laughs> even though I grew up in the conventional mm -hmm. Mormonism. So in this small group, what, I imagine that they kind of preserved a different, a slightly different narrative, like, than the main, you know, the Utah. It is the, very much different, yeah. And the, yeah. and the thing is, is that they were, they were a history-based church. Which oh. the church out here in Utah is very history based compared okay. to a Methodist. But okay. the Latter day Saints in Wisconsin were the same degree more history based. So when you go to church in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. you carry your Nauvoo periodicals, the Times and Seasons. Mm -hmm. You carry the 1830 Book of Mormon and the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants from Kirtland. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If you don't, I mean, typically reprints, but people carry these historic books and and their church services are almost debate-like, or they're lecturing on Mormon history and why they're right. <laughs> Interesting, okay. So they, they really kept, they didn't revise things. They really kept the original. Right, they're, they're, they're arguing as if they are still in 1844. It's almost like a time capsule of people from <laughs> Nauvoo when Joseph Smith dies and nobody knows who his successor is. And Brigham Young initially says, Joseph Smith won't have a successor. There won't be another prophet. And okay. it takes him three and a half years to become, to be elected to the church presidency. And then he could, or at least to be the, the prophetic president. And then he continues throughout his life to say he's not a prophet, very interestingly. Hmm. Oh. And so, okay. well, they don't teach that out here. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> know that. But that's the fact. <laughs> and, okay. and so the things that took place there in Nauvoo between 1844 and when they left in 1846, it's almost like, Time has stopped, and you're in Wisconsin, and you're hearing these same debates. Yeah. They're not talking about what's happening today. They're talking about what Brigham Young did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and they probably, I mean, do you think that their, their um, way of meeting together and their way of debating and their, is probably more similar to what was going on yes. at that time? Like the way that they conducted their churches, do you think they've preserved that more? 
closely to how it really would have yes, been? Yes, I would say that in general, they're frozen in time and that that's a good representation of Nauvoo Mormonism, whereas the Latter-day Saints out here is, have evolved in one way. The mm -hmm. Community of Christ, which used to be called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Independence, mm -hmm. Missouri, has kind of rolled things back. And so they are each very, okay. very different. Mm. Sometimes I think of it in terms of, if you were to compare it to politics, it's as if this is Republican Mormonism and the Community of Christ is Democrat Mormonism and the followers of James Strang are like Libertarian Mormons. Okay, okay. And, that's, that, and so they've followed different evolutions of... Right, and their way of thinking, the part of the brain they're using, I think is very different. Yeah, so what, what do you, what is the most like uh, unique thing you think people would be interested to know about these differences in how they see the world and how they see, or is there really not one major difference? Well, when I was 18, I was, as, I was swept into the arguments about presidential succession, Mormon prophetic succession. Uh, today, I look at it more in terms of trying to understand all Mormons as good people, good humans. So mm -hmm. I see a lot of good out here in Utah, and I'm more interested in how James Strang was a good human. Mm -hmm. um, he was very, very different from the Mormons out here. So James Strang led the church for about 12 years, and then he was martyred or killed, like, or murdered, oh. assassinated, like Justice Smith. Oh my gosh, Smith. okay. And, but in those short 12 years, he did a lot of good things. He uh, ordained black people and not mm. just by happenstance, but by conference resolution. Mm. Uh, this is he, long ago. Mm -hmm, in 1849, wow. James Strang was ordaining black people by conference resolution, which didn't take place in Utah until, 18, until 1978. Wow. Uh, he ordained women uh, to the lesser priesthood, to the Aaronic priesthood. Hmm. And he, and he just, he became a Michigan state legislator and uh, passed uh, resolutions in Michigan uh, this can become too political, but James Strang was essentially a, in Michigan, James Strang as a Michigan legislator was was switching sides to support the other side in abolitionism. And he turned with his speeches in the Michigan House, he turned the state of Michigan towards aboli abolitionism. And then that was followed by Ohio and Pennsylvania and, tra and moved east and then wow. tipped the country essentially into a civil war. James Strang was, was, was the, um, he's igniting this movement in, ab in abolitionism just wow. by, his, by his swing vote and the incredible speeches that he gave in Michigan. Wow, so he, he really fought for something people weren't, that wasn't popular and wasn't common. Right. And that today we would say was what should, you know, the, the right thing to do. And it actually, you know, going against the grain actually had a ripple effect Right, it rippled. That's a good way to um, put it. Among mm -hmm. probably other people, but uh, right. but yeah, that's amazing. But he's forgotten in history. That. But that's but that's really yeah. what happened. You can go back and read the Michigan newspapers, and actually, his name appears in the newspapers all the way across the country. But oh wow, you can go back and, and research that. That's actually what happened. If you go back wow. to the roots of the Civil War, so this is um, you know 1853, 1855, okay. and then the Civil War starts in 1861. That's so interesting. I'd love to learn more. And his other work in the legislature was all towards uh, a fairness and justice towards the American Indians in Michigan. So he okay. was just that kind of a good-hearted person. He protected his people, his Mormon people, um, in terms of uh, economic justice and fairness and providing inheritances, much like Joseph Smith did in Independence, Missouri, or okay. wherever. Yes. So he felt like he embodied, he, he preserved mm -hmm. what he saw what Joseph Smith was intending. Right. And then were you in that particular group or was that a different one from the group yes, that's you the group, were in? Right. Oh, yes, okay. that's the group. So I eventually developed a, a specialty in rare mm -hmm. Mormon books mm -hmm. and it started as, you know, I'm living on Mormon Road and I see myself as an archivist and I'm gathering information and I want more than what they have in Wisconsin. And so I start traveling the country and I make photocopies and gather microfilms and things like that of anything I can learn about uh, that was in terms Mormon. of early Mormon documents from the Joseph Smith period. How did it get out of that? How There's things all over the country. How'd they get there? 
since the time of Justice? I mean, it seems like they would all have gone to Utah or, or there or Michigan. Well, for example, Justice Smith would write letters to people around the country. Oh, right. Okay. Um, but descendants would travel mm -hmm. to different states and die. And, and there's been an active Mormon document market since hmm. at least the 1940s, um, probably earlier, but really, it really got hot in the 1940s through the 1970s. Okay. And most things kind of disappeared after that. They ended up in the libraries during the period from the 1940s to the 1970s. And so you, you know, um, and there were great collectors who were philanthropists who were benefactors of certain institutions. So the, the two big railroad people, Stanford and Huntington, mm -hmm. uh, established libraries in California, and they were collectors of Mormon books, even though they weren't Mormon. Oh, okay. And the Degaliers at the Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, collected Mormon books. Newbery, uh, who established the Newbery Library in Chicago, collected Mormon books, especially Illinois Mormon books, because of Nauvoo. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so on throughout the, the, the country, there's these, and of course, most important, the, uh, the Berrien Collection at uh, New York Public Library and the Coe Collection at Yale University um, are phenomenal collections. Yale University rivals the LDS Church in its quality of rare Mormon books. Oh, wow. And even, huh. even Southern Methodist University has okay. an incredible, I mean, Southern Methodist University, owns, um, Southern Methodist University owns the very rarest of all Mormon books. What? Yes. <laughs> and oh my I do. Gosh. And so I'm one of them. I'm I'm You're... collecting rare Mormon books at a at a you know first class level. I compete with the LDS church at auction oh, and wow. outbid them often. Oh my gosh, because they're probably only willing to go so high and they I are bureaucratic, know. I think is the main thing. So mm -hmm. I can act I can think on my feet and act instantly to make a change in my decision and um, instinctively buy things that they would need committees and months to decide to buy. Oh, okay. So you <laughs> sneak in there and snag them. And, right. And so, but when, did you do, start doing this early enough that you were, did you, is there any finds that you've had where somebody like, well, you can have this, you know, have you ever had any golden finds where you came across something in the thrift shop or somebody had something and you were able to just obtain it? Any? There are some stories like that. I started in 1982. I was a okay. teenager, and I bought my first Joseph Smith period book of Mormon. Okay. Um, it's because I couldn't get anybody to let me make the photocopy I needed. And I was interested in the textual differences between the Palmyra Book of Mormon and the Kirtland Book of Mormon and the Nauvoo Book of Mormon, because that development of that text is crucial to understanding uh, that book. So I, I wanted a copy of 1840, couldn't afford one, try to make tried to get a photocopy, no library would cooperate, and so I did. I went out and bought one from a bookstore out here in Salt Lake City called Cosmic Airplane. Oh. And they had one. And they sold it to me for about um, $1,800. I think it was oh. 2000 and they gave me a 10% discount. Okay. Maybe because I was a kid. Okay, that's <laughs> nice. And that book today is worth about 45000 So the books, okay. it wasn't a bad nice. investment for an 18-year-old. Yeah, yeah. And I guess and you I've couldn't been, have predicted that, so that's right, a great... Right, and, and I've been going on ever since. Okay. Uh, do I get lucky? Sometimes. Um, I remember in the early days of eBay, I bought a... In, in 1996, I think it was, about that eBay became popular. And it was mostly book collectors at first, people that had come over from the book <clears throat> dealer sites and were trying to find books on eBay. And I think... It was mostly men, unfortunately, and so they were passing through things that were Mormon, and there was this needle point, and I mm -hmm. scrolled past it for a minute, and then I said, wait a minute, what was that? And I went back up, and it said mm -hmm. New Jerusalem, but it, it didn't say Mormon in the title. It said New Jerusalem needle point. Okay. And so I was like, that's interesting, and I clicked on it, and the reason it had showed up in my search re Results was that they were in an, an antique store in Keokuk, Iowa, and they had put in their foot around the bottom that they're a, you know, a neat antique store across the river from Mormon, Nauvoo, Illinois. And so it showed up in my search as Mormon, but it was the New Jerusalem Temple from Independence, Missouri. And it was a needlepoint made by a 14-year-old girl who was living in the mansion house as a maid. Oh, and wow. she made this, she had access to Joseph Smith's um, now lost architectural drawings of the Independence Missouri Temple. Oh, wow. And so it's a full-color Nauvoo period 
uh, image of the 1833 Mormon temple that never got built in Independence, Missouri. Oh my gosh, and the, the thrift store probably didn't completely know what they had. They had it on there for the exact price of, the average price of the average needle point, about $750. And now it's worth? <laughs> a million. A million? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So, I guess I'm not. So it's worth searching. People should search. Yeah. There, are, there are things out there that are. That if you but can that's what I do. I work up. full time. I, mm -hmm. I'm the only person in the world who works full time, 365 days a year, traveling to acquire, to find, track down lost, legendary, sacred things, Mormon artifacts. There mm -hmm. are other people that buy Mormon books. There are bookstores and university professors. But I'm the only person who just does this. That's all I do is crisscross the country. And, yes. and it's still just Mormon focus, or do you end so, up yes, with other So, yes, so going back to the Vermont period, I'm interested in the influences of the Smiths, the influences oh, yeah. on the Smiths mm -hmm. that come from the other New England Protestant faiths. And so mainly, uh, first of all, Congregationalism, mm -hmm. um, Universalism, uh, Methodism, eventually, not too early, uh, the Baptists, um, Their family went through these. Yeah, well, Congregationalism was the state religion of Massachusetts and Vermont. Okay. You couldn't have a national religion, but you could have a state religion. Oh, okay. And then the Universalists started pushing back uh, on, you know, a different look, and then and then the Baptists and the Methodists came into Vermont while the Smiths were there. Um, not too strong on the Methodists, but then when they got to uh, New York, the um, Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Baptists were pretty big. And then there was this other group called the Restorationists, or that's what we call them today. And it was the uh, very similar to the Smith family. Um, it's very similar to what the Book of Mormon, well, it's complicated, but it's about, it's about the stories of American religions and how they were vying for an audience. And mm -hmm. the Smiths were caught up in this um, Eventually, they end up calling it the Burnt Over District or the Burned Over District oh. in Western New York. Yeah, I've where heard all that. these religions are crisscrossing with revivalism. Okay, and it's kind of the thing. It's like the you could I don't know if you'd say cool thing, but it's everyone was caught up in you know religion was kind of one of the exciting things going on. They were debating. Uh, this is the impression I've got. I might be wrong. You're exactly right. They no, you know you perfect. had all these different pastors preaching different perfect. things. They were kind of competing against perfect. each other. Yes, I'm sure. I would imagine there was. Uh, I don't know if that era, if that era had, um, you know, people fainting and yes. and, and speaking yes. in tongues, and so yes. it was probably kind of like it was like today you would go to a concert and everybody's just overcome with emotion. A concert is a perfect example um, or a fair. So the Smiths okay. are traveling. Now this is later, uh, in 1820 to 1825, the Smiths are in this mode where they're going to these revivals and they're on the outskirts of Palmyra. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Smith Sr. is like a peddler, and he's peddling his own homemade gingerbread, and he's mm. peddling his own homemade root beer, which was like a small beer. It was a low-alcohol beer. I know how to make it. Do you? I've started making homemade root beer this year. It's I want some. Really, it's really f interesting and fun. <laughs> okay, so this is what Joseph Smith is doing, and he's using okay. his own ingredients, and he's mm -hmm. got a tradition of working with ginseng and and mm. ginger and different roots. And That's interesting to me. And something they called the Thompsonite or Thompsonian uh, style of medicine that was, mm. that those kind of people, Cause, backwoods people were interested in. Uh, yeah, because actually back then, I don't know if you know this, but I know this from herbalism, that um, actually root beer or cough syrup, I'm not sure which would have come first, but one probably came from the other or they intersected because right. it's right. the same recipe. It's, you got your roots and your beneficial herbs. Right. You do a... a um, infusion of it, and then exactly. um, you use that, to, you add sugar, and then ferment it, and it, that's the same the process. The Smithsonian maple syrup. Oh. Okay. Maple sap, yeah. Oh, yeah, that they would have gotten directly from the tree. Right. And Joseph Smith Sr. was actually mm -hmm. making the wooden casks that the root beer was going in. I and so I've never there are known descriptions. this. No, nobody knows this. So <laughs> no. there are descriptions of Joseph Smith Sr., and he's uh -huh. tall. He's, I forget, 6'6 six, six or something. Joseph Smith Sr. Oh. is tall. Okay. And and he's wearing a perfect pressed white clothing and a perfectly pressed white apron, and his mm -hmm. gingerbread is in 
perfect white squares of perfectly wrapped white paper. And he's selling this gingerbread and he's selling other things, hard boiled eggs and everything, but it's mainly cakes and beer as the sign said. And Lucy Max Smith made the sign. And he's like this peddler and he's going to, and you can't imagine what these revivals looked like. They were, they were down some muddy road where too many horses had dumped their manure on and had rutted the road and back in the woods there'd be a clearing and here'd be all this activity and it was like a fair and there were people lined up on the road selling their wares. This is amazing to hear. I love this. Yeah, and so these preachers, and so this is the story of Joseph Smith Jr. He says he was at the revival meeting and heard the preacher preach and then he Mm -hmm. went into the grove and prayed about it. And so Mm -hmm. really root beer (laughs) is how Mormonism started. (laughs) So that's that's what we owe. If it our weren't whole... for root beer, Joseph Smith Jr. We... wouldn't have been there, and if he hadn't been there, he wouldn't have gone into the grove. <laughs> oh my goodness, that is amazing! And root beer is so good; it deserves this honor. Right. And <laughs> so. Joseph Smith Sr. had had, a tr- had had actually some experience in uh, refining and processing food, so he had back in around 1802 had been refining or processing um, uh, ginseng in mm-hmm. Vermont, and he was. Okay very commercial about it. He had a store. Mm. A, it was a small store. and he, he would go to Boston and get tinware and things on credit. And then he would sell them in a store and trade. It was a big bar, a lot of bartering going on in Vermont. The mm-hmm. money, monetary system wasn't too developed. Right. And so he was trading uh, the tinware for ginseng. And then he mm-hmm. was intending to take the ginseng to China. And that ended up flopping for much, for very complicated mm. reasons that I've that's a whole chapter in my, in an upcoming book. That's a whole chapter. Just story. the ginseng alone is a whole chapter to write about. This is, this is so interesting. I am loving learning about this. I've never heard, I've never heard this and angle so, about, I've really never heard much about Joseph Smith's father. Lucy wrote a biography of Joseph Smith in 1853. Okay. It was published in 1853 in Liverpool, England. And most people use Lucy Smith as, as, almost all we know about the Vermont period and used to be almost all we knew about the New York period because we wanted to ignore what the neighbors said. But I've taken Lucy's book as a starting point Mm -hmm. and I use it like a template to take each thing that she says and then further research it. So the reason we know about Mm -hmm. the ginseng is because Lucy told us about the ginseng. And then so I took that and developed her one paragraph about Mm -hmm. ginseng into an entire chapter. Okay. Um, So... Lucy's book is the, is the origin of, the, of a story about how she traveled from Norwich, Vermont, where the Smiths were living in 1816, and traveled to Palmyra and, on a stage, and Joseph was walking behind the stage. This might be the story that I remember. Right, and I actually dispute that story among, I actually dispute a lot, a lot of what Lucy says, not because she's being mm-hmm. deceptive, but it's through her own lens of life, and after losing so many of her children or boys Um, and then 10 years later she's a a widow so in 1853 she's talking about the 1802 ginseng experience that's a good 50 years later and she's got a story that her husband wasn't treated fairly Mm -hmm. and my story is that the ginseng market failed that year okay (laughs) so um (laughs) So and so was, she tells these stories. Yeah. So on the, on the thing about Joseph traveling behind, she's writing a book complaining that Joseph, who had had leg surgery a few years earlier, is being forced by this terrible, mean uh, stagecoach driver and being forced to walk behind. But what I'm trying to visualize is why was Lucy up there? She's actually a pretty young woman. She was born in 1776, and she's telling the story about 1816. So she's 40. And she's got her crippled son walking behind the wagon while she's up there enjoying and, life. Yeah. And so I actually don't <laughs> see everything the same way. I try to visualize every single part. Now, I love Lucy. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I'm just, my job is to put things in order and understand them based on her life experience and her yeah. life experience after so many bad things happened to her children uh, was was a certain lens that she's looking through. And she feels yep. that, that the Smith family was unfairly treated from the beginning to the end by everybody. Oh, every neighbor, oh. every person didn't treat the Smith family fairly. Oh, so that's kind and of And I a, think that's okay. I'm yeah. listening. Mm-hmm. Her view is valid mm-hmm. and I care, but I want to understand a more fuller context. Yeah, because we all have perceptions and mm-hmm. 
uh, and our perception of how things mm -hmm. are all go down. And someone who's very loyal might perceive things that way. Mm -hmm. But if you have but, a bigger picture, it but might don't be. mistake me. After doing all this research in Vermont and Massachusetts and Western New York and even the top of Pennsylvania, my belief is that the Smith family was as good as any family in all of New England and Western New York. As so, good and as bad, maybe. But that's just you know <laughs> they do have their lenses, and you have to mm -hmm. explore farther, further. You can't uh, you can't take everything at face value. As a, as a historian, you want to build a complete context and understand mm -hmm. the environment of the founding of Mormonism. So, the, with his father's um, root beer, how did you know that all the details about that? What are the sources for all the details? So about I collect that? all the documents and things that other people <clears throat> either overlooked or if I if I have the original document, they obviously don't know about it because I'm waiting till my book is published. But if it's, okay. uh, there are many cases where things are, are in books from the period or from, or since then that people, that other historians haven't <gasps> stumbled on the details. Or they don't have access to it. Or they don't have access. Oh my gosh, takes, we never think about this. It's we, full time research. Like mm -hmm. in this day and age we think, oh, the experts or the historians have all the info and you know, we just need to go and read everything they have to say in all their documentation. But we don't realize, there's documents everywhere. There's universities have their set of documents. A church might have its set mm -hmm. of documents. Mm -hmm. An individual might have documents that no one has. So and I've never thought about this before, that if an individual could have one document that has information that no one else has because it, they pass it down in their family, if that person never chooses to make it public or, or, exactly. or right. if they never even think about making it public, maybe right. it's in an attic right. and they've never even read it because they've passed right. down in their family, there's right. information that's just literally not out there. Right. So history is a difficult thing, is it? A and difficult... Yes, and Utah historians are the very best in the world. You have the incredibly mm -hmm. gifted, talented, earnest, uh, hardworking historians at BYU and mm -hmm. the LDS Church, but in spite of all their qualities, there's kind of an intellectual inbreeding going on. So they learn from each other. And mm -hmm. if you're a historian working for the Joseph Smith papers or for the church, and you were educated at BYU, you're learning things that you, it's tough to unlearn, I think. And so you're inside the box and I'm trying to be outside mm -hmm. the box. Sometimes so I call, hmm? Oh, go ahead. Sometimes I call my view like the third view of Mormonism. Okay. Because you've got, uh, a contest taking place between church historians and anti-Mormon historians, if you will. And I have this third view. I'm out yeah. there looking for ways to compromise and understand and put things into context to find out what really happened without being in a position where I have to be only faith promoting or only destructive to the Smith family. Right, yeah. I don't see the Smiths mm -hmm. despite any struggles that they had as, I mean, you don't know, you know the Smiths they were living on flour and milk when they arrived in Vermont. They were as poor as people can be. They were the landless poor who, mm -hmm. who migrated with many others like them from Massachusetts and many came from Connecticut and arrived in, in these hills and they had to go up these steep hills and figure out how to forge out a living. And the poor Smiths lived in, in a narrow thing they call a gore. Okay between two towns, they couldn't even live between two townships. I mean, they couldn't even be in a, in a township. They were between two towns What's called the Tun... A gore, when they laid out Vermont, they, they laid it out in squares, six miles each. And so there was a Tunbridge, town, a town of Tunbridge, which is different than a village. So a town in Vermont is a square of land, six miles by six miles. And so there's Tunbridge, and below that there's, there's Royalton, and next to that there's Sharon, and beside Tunbridge, there's Royal, there's uh, Randolph, and mm -hmm. the Smiths, and they lay out these thing, these squares, but they they don't lay them out right, and so there's a there's a, a, a gore of land between the two <laughs> towns, and you're you're not in one town or the other, oh. and that's where the Smiths settled in 1791 in Tunbridge Gore. Okay. Up in the hills. Was that their choice? specifically or they we just... don't know that but okay. we know that they had to climb the hill and they had to take down a few trees and they built a, a log house first and they had to put tree branches and bark over the roof to to have a house and they had an open door they didn't have a door on the house for the first winter and they kept a fireplace a fire going in the doorway to keep the 
that place People warm. these days have no idea how they, they had much one, you can survive. They had one cow and they had some flour mm -hmm. and they ate milk and flour. Wow. There's a lot, there's a decent amount of things you can make with milk and flour, <laughs> but... <laughs> they were stirring <laughs> it like cereal. They had nothing yeah. to eat. They barely, barely made it. Oh. So you've got the Smiths there and, and right. So then things come out from the Smith experience, like experience like money digging. Have you heard of money digging? Digging? Money digging. Well, I, okay, what I always hear is that, you know, Joseph Smith and his father maybe were digging for gold, which a lot of families were, I think, probably back then. And then, you know, I also hear the opposite. Well, they were gold diggers. You know, that's the negative version of it. And that's really all I've, it's just a very vague. So that's I didn't why even I brought know, that up. So it's a perfect yeah. example of how the Latter-day Saints want to pretend it didn't happen or that it was something... Uh, entirely innocent, like they were simply hired by people who thought they could find silver and asked if the Smiths could help. Mm -hmm. The anti-Mormons will tell a terrible story about ethics and um, fraud and yeah. and other things. So the truth is actually in the middle on that one. Okay. You know, the Smiths are eating flour and water, and yes, they're 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 the Smiths in Vermont were Old Testament people, and mm -hmm. it, it's entirely different from the Christians in of you know the doctors of divinity that were educated at Yale and Harvard and Dartmouth and Princeton at that time, uh, the Vermonters. If you look at the census records, it is, it's astonishing how many people born in Vermont during that period have Old Testament first names, given names, including okay. Joseph, okay. Hiram, okay. Um, Ephraim was one of the Smith sons. Hmm. Okay. Um, and so they're you know they're an Old Testament based culture in Vermont, and it's because of the long, cold winters. These people huddled together and studied the Old Testament at least twice a day as okay. a family. Because they had only so many books, and that was one of them. Right, and so they're, yeah, and so they're getting the ideas of giftedness from the Old Testament, and they feel entitled to participate in the same gifts. And so mm -hmm. when you read about mosaic rods and, and ironic rods, what the people in those days called divining rods, you know, if Moses could look for water with a rod, Hmm. then hmm. they could look for water with a rod. Right. And so... and so uh, You're getting your teachings directly it's, out of it's your... A, it's a cultural thing. The Smiths uh, were doing it, but it wasn't... It's more innocent than one might think. So the core of beliefs that they had about, like, gifts of the Spirit or whatever, how, I, I think one impression I've gotten of Joseph Smith was like, you know, everyone should be able to have gifts of the Spirit. That was also kind of... You know, some of these things kind of came from his background. Right. So the Smiths are able to uniquely blend Old Testament theology and New Testament theology. They they reconcile it. And As compared things, to Vermontians or that no. was kind of a so unique... this was what the what they called in those days the restoration movement or the, or what yes. historians call the restoration Which, movement. It didn't Mormonism is it is a is one part of all Mormons are restorationists, but not all restorationists are Mormons. Yes, there were actually, other people that understood, that wanted to, you know, shed the traditions of congregationalism and wanted to go back to biblical things. And they didn't okay. want to use words like Trinity, for example. Yeah. They objected to the word Trinity. Trinity mm -hmm. is not a biblical word. Why are we using it? Oh. We shouldn't use the word Trinity to describe our faith. Which we was a use... more Catholic-based word, maybe. So, uh -huh. yes. So, there don't... Catholicism wasn't too big there, but um, they wanted to get rid of, you know, the creeds of the Protestants and use only what's in the Bible. So that wasn't oh, unique okay. to the Smiths. Yeah. Um, it, and I don't think Old Testament study was unique to the Smiths. But you can see what came out of the Old Testament into Mormonism, polygamy, um, tabernacles, mm -hmm. temples, Melchizedek yeah. priesthood, Aaronic priesthood, um, tithing, um, Zion, gathering, Gathering of Israel. All these terms. Oh, this is all. Um, I could go on. I okay. Dozens, uh, probably, of main main concepts, central central concepts to Mormonism, come out of the okay. Old Testament, and that's not the same in among Baptists, for example. And it's a history-based mm -hmm. faith, so uh, we do look. There's a reason why a first edition Mormon hymnal from 1835 is worth a half a million dollars in a and a first and a, and a Methodist hymnal from 1835 is worth about five dollars. It's just okay. the Mormons are history-based people. We love our heritage, 
and we we are validated by our heritage. We're grounded in our heritage. Okay, I guess you that... can't be Mormon without without the origins of Mormonism. But Methodism was more of a doctrinal based movement rather than a okay. restorative movement, and so the oh. history isn't relevant. Nobody cares about how Mormon how Methodism started. Oh. It's just what you believe. It's their doctrine. Or they if might get taught it at some point, but it's not like ours where. We're always talking about right. the foundation mm -hmm. all the time. It's a very, like, and maybe people might not know that if they aren't that familiar. I don't mean to discount the doctrine. Like, I mean, there's nothing more complex than uh -huh. Latter-day Saint doctrine. Yeah. But we're, we're history-based also. I didn't mean to the exclusion of other well, yeah, um, I, yeah, validity to our faith. But, yeah. but we have that, I think, uniquely among all religions. Okay. Modern history is uniquely important to Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Catholics might study to. the Crusades or something, and you, if you're Lutheran, you might study Martin Luther, but it isn't the basis of your faith. Okay. We, we have our history. We know Joseph Smith had his first vision, and we know he found the plates, and we know he translated the Book of Mormon, and we know he printed the Book of Mormon, and we know they built the first temple in Kirtland. Those are all essential to our faith. And then the doctrine follows. I think mm -hmm. in Methodism, you're going to see the doctrine come first. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I've never, I've never thought about that. Mm -hmm. way. I actually also didn't realize that the that the history was so important. I had always been taught these stories growing up, so I, it was an important element. But I didn't realize how important until I got into my teens and I started being more exposed to Utah stuff. Because I, you know, being, coming from a family who was, you know, has a background overseas and stuff, I. I really didn't know that much about how important the pioneer stuff was, and so Where are you from? this makes sense. My mom's from New Zealand, oh, and uh -huh. my dad is from. Um, his family goes back to Kentucky and Ohio, not not LDS. Both sides not okay. LDS. But they weren't restorationists in Kentucky and Ohio because those are big there. The Church of Christ or the Christian movement, Alexander Campbell. Um, I my family on my dad's side is actually very religious. But I'm realizing I don't know as much about their mm. background, and I will. I now want to learn about it. Actually, yeah. <laughs> this is inspiring me to want to know more of their yeah. background. So what I'm doing is I'm. The the historians out here continue to use the same documents and the same books. What I'm doing is I'm working on Vermont, uh, and Western New York to try to build a bigger picture of what. Of what influenced this movement. Yes, so which if I, I want to talk about ginseng, I'm going to read every single newspaper mm -hmm. from that decade that talks about ginseng and why the ginseng was being processed, how it was being processed. I'm reading all the Methodist and Baptist and Congregationalist and Universalist publications from the period. And in the end, the Book of Mormon is as Christian as any book in, in the period. And the Smith family is as, a, is as Christian as any family in the area, in spite okay. of accusations of fraud or... Oh, that it's, the, they focus too much on Joseph Smith and not enough on Jesus and mm -hmm. that kind yeah. of stuff. Is that what, is that what inspired you to, to take that view or angle or... I think it was really just the ability to understand rare books. Originally it was more of an interest in the Nauvoo period and I worked closely with trying to understand the Nauvoo Temple and its architecture and the art of the Nauvoo period and the succession crisis and the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. So it's all Nauvoo for me originally. Mm -hmm. And then I just grew to understand rare books as a collector of rare books. And so that gave me uh, different talents to, to uh, find and access um, books printed in Vermont and Western New York. So what have you learned about this? I mean, I guess you have, you've been getting into it, but what have you learned about the Smith family and their origins that has, is something you weren't expecting or? Well, I just think that wherever I saw them make a mistake, I loved them more for it, not less. Okay. And they made mistakes, but they, they were just the most earnest and sincere and hardworking people. Just like any other family. Well, no, I think they were, oh. I think they were special. Uh, what, what, what do you think makes them special? What's different about them? I think it's that, I've, I've said that the people in Vermont were looking back into um, 
Old Testament things, but I think the Smiths just had a unique um, earnestness and ability to, to do that. I mean, when I say it was happening in Vermont, I don't mean everybody. There were non-believers in religion in Vermont, and there were a lot of, a lot of universalists, but the Smiths were just um, so faithful about how they did their research and advocated. I think the Smiths had a a little bit of a feeling of disenfranchisement, and I think that went back several generations, not just Justice mm -hmm. Jr. and Justice Sr., but Azahel Smith and Samuel Smith before him, and maybe all the way back to the Samuel and the Robert before them. And I think that they, and maybe even the Robert before Robert in England. <laughs> That's pretty far back. They, they, uh, there was a family line of feeling that they um, were never quite in the mainstream and that they mm. always had to struggle and that they were often landless. Interesting. Um, the first Robert Smith, the, 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 the Robert Smith that came to uh, Boston and New England in Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, came as a indentured servant and oh. his family had been servants for one family for generations in England. Wow. And so they were almost slaves when they came here and they um, built themselves up to be yeomen and gentlemen in Massachusetts and then and then lost it all. They became landless again. Hmm. Joseph Smith Sr. and his father Azahel who had been, Azahel had actually been a you know, pretty prominent respected citizen but then they had nothing and so the Azahel Smith and his sons including Joseph Smith Sr. moved up into Vermont landless and, and so, carved out a yeah. living and then lost it again. Interesting. That That kind of reminds me of the, um, it kind of feels like the Jewish narrative, which is, which the history of that is of, you know, kind of like disenfranchisement it and is. loss and like that, yeah. these ups and downs and when are we going to be free of this? It's almost like the, we, it, can't, we can't shed this. <laughs> and it may be, you know, as we stir up Mormonism out here now in the information age and some people lose their faith, that it would be nice if Latter-day Saints continued to respect their heritage and, and understand um, where they came from and how we got here and that Mormonism become more of a cultural thing for some. If they can't believe everything, they should stay in the movement and stay in the faith hmm. for um, fellowship reasons and fraternity and understand that, that we're uniquely Mormon, we'll always be culturally Mormon even if so you see many people leave the church and they yeah. and they just completely turn from everything. They turn from their heritage, they turn from their from their immediate family, they turn from their from prior knowledge that they had and become rebellious. And I don't it doesn't bother me so much that people lose their faith, but that they completely turn from all good because Mormonism is a very good thing for most people. That's, a, that's an interesting point because there are actually, I mean, a lot of religions, people kind of just stop going and, you know, for years, they aren't particularly, you know, spot, you know, uh, sure on all the doctrine if you were to ask them about right, it, but right. they're like, I'm Methodist. Right, right. It's a but culture. In Mormonism, you're always Catholic, right. You go to, you maybe yeah. go with your parents on Christmas or Easter, yeah, but you're going to be Catholic. You but go. You don't, and you consider to find things to go. But you're not thinking about the theology, and you're not reading, and you're not trying to become more knowledgeable in Catholicism. And I think but, the, you mentioned Jews, and so people that mm -hmm. are Jewish are uniquely, they're always Jewish. That's, that's their identity, and they retain that. But they with don't Mormonism, question whether the Red Sea was really divided and then throw it all away. Yeah, and then I have to, because I, I found a flaw that I can't reconcile, and I, right. and I, and I, will, I will never, I, I don't agree with it. Right. Like it, it's it's like I've exposed this whole thing and, and I can't, I mean, there are probably reasons why this happens, but yeah, it becomes a thing where you're either in or you're out and you're not right, anywhere, right. So but other religions be, don't really have that for some reason. Sure, sure. You can be Protestant and decide that the book of Isaiah for scholarly reasons uh, can't be uh, pinned to the, to the time that Isaiah lived and that maybe it was altered or, or even written after Isaiah. Uh -oh. And so you might be Baptist and say, I don't really believe the book of Isaiah, but you wouldn't leave. But yeah. Mormons, you know, 
the book of Abraham isn't true, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with all of it. It's I'm all going over. to have some brandy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Finally, I can do what I want. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's And the book of Abraham for... isn't what, peop what people think it is. It was mm -hmm. canonized in 1880 or 1882, uh, but, but it was something Joseph Smith worked on as a intellectual exercise in the School of the Prophets, and he worked with Oliver Cowdery and... W. W. Phelps and Sidney Rigdon, and they were, you know, at that time studying Greek and Latin and Hebrew and Egyptian and German even, and oh. they were trying to understand ancient, ancient uh, scripture, and they acquired these Book of Abraham fragments, and they, um, we don't know the whole process of what they did, but then ultimately Joseph Smith prints it in the Times and Seasons newspaper, and he says the following is purported to be you know, this ancient record, but he didn't say it was. He didn't say it was translated by the gift and power of God. He didn't say anything. What? And then, and it's printed in the sister newspaper in England, the, the Millennial okay. Star. So it's printed in the Times and Seasons Nauvoo in the Millennial Star in England, and then nothing, okay. and then um, nine years Which later. Which is interesting. You would print something interesting in a newspaper. It, it was doesn't just an mean, interesting thing that we're mean, working on. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean you're saying, this is Revelation, you're just printing it. We're just printing this. And then nine years later, it appears in a missionary tract called The Pearl of Great Price. And the, the Pearl of Great Price that time, in 1851, when they did the first edition, was like when an author dies, as Joseph Smith did, and you put together his, they used to call them unpublished works, the unpublished, the, the Pearl of Great Price is really the unpublished writings of Joseph Smith. And oh. so they collect together everything that's not in the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine mm -hmm. of Covenants and they put it in this little pamphlet and they just make up a, a synthetic name called the Pearl of Great Price. And it's yeah. a synthetic compilation. Joseph Smith didn't write the Pearl of Great Price. They just grabbed things from all the church newspapers and put them in this tract. And okay. then it doesn't get published again till well, 50, 50, 25 years later. Brigham Young didn't like the pamphlet Oh. He didn't even like printing. Okay. So he dies in 1877, and they finally reprint it in 1878, the year after Brigham Young died. Oh. So that's, uh, you know, more than 25 years later, they print the Pearl of Great Price again, and then a couple of years after that, they canonized it as, a, as an official scripture. Okay. okay, well, the Book of Abraham has validity. You can believe in the Book of Abraham. I encourage you to believe in the Book of Abraham. But if you don't, why would you leave Mormonism? Mormonism is good. <laughs> <laughs> this is so interesting. I love this. Why does it have to? Yeah, it's it, it's it's it was put in the book of scripture, which has the gold leafing and everything. So mm -hmm, it's like, well, mm -hmm. it's in our scriptures, so we it's must official. believe that it's scripture. It's, it's official, in there. Right. It's in the book. But you could <laughs> but you could make this, then you, the same argument about the Book of Mormon. At mm -hmm. worst, I mean, at best, the Book of Mormon is an authentic ancient record. At mm -hmm. worst, it's the best parable ever written, that provides incredible insights into anybody's life, spiritual guidance. It compels all people to do good, to come to Christ, to obey the commandments, take care of your family. Yeah, there's so actually worst, a lot of good stuff in there that people don't At worst, don't really... if I stopped believing in the Book of Mormon, I would read it every day as a parable to guide my mm -hmm. life. Yeah, just like the Bible, you've got good things and bad things, and right. throwing out the good because you you know, don't disagree with the bad. That's never right. been my inclination. Anytime I read any book, mm -hmm. I always look, take out the good and I say, well, that I don't agree with. <laughs> right. So that's how I see the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon okay. is the greatest book ever written. It really is. Ever? Ever written. <laughs> yeah, okay. The Book of Mormon is the greatest book. <laughs> well, I book. guess you do think yeah. that because you're, you're... It should be taught in high schools in America as, a, as the best parable ever written. It is an incredibly... Okay. It's, it's genius. If it's a parable, if it's not true, it's more important than if, than if it is true. It's, if it's okay. not written by God, then it's the best thing man ever wrote. <laughs> it's, then it's, okay, then it's still astounding because it's, you know, it's great lessons. Interestingly, Joseph Smith said that about the Apocrypha, <clears throat> which are a group yeah. of books that um, some Christians believed and some didn't were right. authentic from the... He said what? There's a revelation in the Doctrine of Covenants that addresses what to do with translating oh, the Apocrypha. Right, so Joseph right. Smith is working on the Old Testament, translating it, revising it, mm -hmm. and he gets to the Apocrypha and he prays about it and asks if they should translate the Apocrypha, the group of books. And he's told not to, but you can read them for insight, he's told. Yeah, right. But not fact. <laughs>
Right. Well, why wouldn't you look at the Book of Mormon the same way if you had doubts? Anyway, it's yeah. good to have doubts. It's healthy to have doubts, mm -hmm. and maybe your faith will increase. But if I had a doubt in the Book of Mormon and I were a member of the church out here in Utah, I would stay in the church. It's good for your family. It's, it's good for your in-laws and your children and your grandchildren and your grandparents or whoever your extended family is. It's good for all, all of your relationships in Utah. Okay, so I feel like we should go to some of your artifacts you have yes. here. Um, yes. I'm going to show you a couple of photographs first. So this is a painting of Joseph Smith made in 1842. Okay. That's a, obviously a photograph of it. Okay. And that's painted by a Brooklyn, New York artist named David Rogers. It's probably the best portrait we have of Joseph Smith. And okay. there's a companion painting of his wife painted by before. David Rogers. Right. Most people are familiar with those. Mm -hmm. The problem with those, even though they're the very best and they're full-sized mm -hmm. oil paintings uh, at a three-quarter view, they're not necessarily accurate. And okay. to give you an example, this is another painting painted mm -hmm. in Nauvoo during the same okay. period, probably the same year, probably by either uh, William Major or or one of the other oil painters, portrait painters in Nauvoo. Of Joseph Smith? No, this is, I'm sorry, Joseph Smith's uncle, John Smith. Oh, okay. Who lived long enough to be, so this is Joseph Smith's brother. They look alike. They look alike. And this is, in, and this is a, a photograph of him taken <gasps> 10 or more years later. Wow. And you can see how much... Mm -hmm. different they are. They really okay. worked, these painters uh, work to make them more aristocratic. Oh, you can goodness. see how aristocratic Joseph is here in this painting. Mm -hmm. So what did he really look like? We actually don't know. This gives us a glimpse into what he looked like, but it's not the full picture, so to speak. No that pun intended. Makes, <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense because today even our phones have filters on them because we want to have mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. smooth skin or, you know, you can adjust, when, when someone's in a magazine, they do all of these adjustments. I mean, we all right, know how right. much they edit magazine pictures. It's the same thing with right. a painter. Right, so going back to this one. That's interesting. Then, of Joseph. Okay. We have actually three good images of Joseph from his lifetime. I can put those away then. Okay. We have the three-quarter <laughs> portrait, the three-quarter angle view of Joseph Smith uh, painted by David Rogers from Brooklyn in Nauvoo mm -hmm. in 1842. Mm -hmm. We also have a death mask. They okay. poured plaster over his face and took a, mm -hmm. an image of his features when he was killed. And then we have a portrait made by a man named Sutliff Maudsley. I'm gonna talk mostly about Maudsley tonight, even though I have okay. some David Rogers paintings, they're oil paintings and I can't bring them. But I brought a few works by Maudsley and Maudsley's recognized by almost every Latter-day Saint, but very few have ever heard his name. Have you ever heard the name Sutliff Maudsley? I haven't, but I have seen all of these, but I'm right. I'm, I'm weirdly, I do, I'll de dive deep into things, so. Right, so I've people know these. Maudsley's work, but they don't know his name. Here's another one, it's Justice Smith's mother, Lucy, who we've talked about, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a well-known Maudsley, one of the favorites. They're very beautiful and stylistic. Mm -hmm. And so I brought some Maudsleys today, some original Maudsleys. I wanted to oh make sure gosh. you knew who he was by first showing you a couple of well-known uh, images that are owned by the church. Okay. Do I need gloves? I feel like... No. No. Because the, we're not going to actually handle the, okay. any paper. Okay. So this is a portrait of Joseph and Hiram oh, Smith. Oh, that's not a book. And this <laughs> okay. is by Maudsley, and this is a new discovery of mine. Oh my gosh. It's Joseph and Hiram. They're painted from life by Maudsley. <gasps> from life? Yes, Maudsley okay. painted from life. He actually traced them. Kay. He had them stand up against mm -hmm. a wall and he used shadows and he traced a profile mm -hmm. and then he filled in. And then I okay. kind of think of Maudsley's work almost like paper dolls because Maudsley will make one image mm -hmm. of Joseph Smith and he's a pattern maker. So okay. he's able to make one image of Joseph Smith from life and then, he, mm -hmm. and then he can make many more. And as he makes different ones, he changes their clothes. And ah. so sometimes Joseph hmm. is in a blue suit, sometimes he's in a black suit, sometimes he's in a military uniform. But it's sometimes the same he's face even in a white and the suit. same It's exactly stance. the same. Right, he, he'll, <laughs> he'll adjust them. He, he maybe would see them mm -hmm. somewhere and he would 
you know, obviously added the military uniform with a great deal of accuracy. So we think that he wasn't just making up outfits, but that they were actually the person's clothing. But he didn't have yeah. to trace them every time. Yeah. But again, the, f the finer features like the eyebrows and the hair and things are, are done uh, uniquely each, in each. So there's, there's a lot of variation. But you can hold that and take a close look. Oh, my goodness. I have goodness. a box made for it. With the, it's, in, it's in the original Nauvoo frame. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Are, should, we be, should you be touching it? I mean, don't you? Well, the wood is acidic anyway. Okay. So, All right. Well, okay. You know. You know the about these things. The case here I is entirely acid-free and museum quality okay. materials. You just hear, if you touch your scrapbook paper, it's going to disintegrate in no, 100 we're years. Good. I, I promise. Okay. I, nothing's more <laughs> important to me than preservation and, okay. and preserving the value. And I'm sure you know what you're doing. Yeah. I like women in Mormon history. Uh, women in Mormon history has been neglected, and Ooh. I'm trying to be at the forefront of promoting uh, Latter-day Saint women's studies and particularly early Mormon women. Oh. Uh, Maudsley had a student, Bathsheba Smith, who married George Smith. Heard of her. This is a painting she made of Joseph, and she's one of okay. Maudsley's students. Oh my gosh. Now, people have seen this, but they've only seen it in black and white. This actually um, appears in the Wikipedia article cool. on Joseph Smith's biography in black oh. and white. And the reason okay. is, is because it was photographed, poor, it was a poor quality photograph of this painting made in the 1940s. Okay. And they used that poor quality black and white photograph in okay. the Wikipedia article biography of Joseph Smith, but this is actually the original. I tracked it down mm. and bought it. Where did you find this? I got it from the Smith family. The so Smith part of my whole family. thing with James Strang and the elderly people is that yeah. that taught me a genuine appreciation for elderly people, but it also, being from the smaller group in Wisconsin and Michigan, helped me relate to the people that were descendants in the community of Christ or all the other of the smaller groups. So I can just as well talk to a Strangite, but I can talk to a so-called Cutlerite or a so-called Bickertonite or a so-called Whiteite or All these Whitmerite offshoots of Mormonism. Or, and I go to them and we're cousins, you know, where we're all ostracized by the so-called Brighamites. <laughs> these people are like cousins. We have a kinship. We understand. We all have the persecution complex and I can go to them and, and and talk about Maudsley with a with a true appreciation that they can recognize and can't be can't be duplicated. So people that were more in those smaller groups kind of preserve. They all yes. are more so aware if I of go, this stuff. So if I go meet with somebody from David Whitmer, we get it. It's like we're cousins, and we have shared a life experience that's different. Wow. So anyway, this one came from. Oh out, my goodness. This one actually came from out here in Utah, though. Uh, this came from the George A. Smith family. Uh, and how did they, oh, you, I think it you already said. It was handed down in their family, so. This, okay. George Smith is Joseph Smith's cousin. So and, there were Smiths that come here, I, that came to Utah? I'm not yes, as clear not on Joseph that. Yes, not Joseph Smith's family. So uh, there were other relatives. George, jo, uh, Joseph Smith Sr.'s brother, John Smith, came out here, and some of his other brothers came out here. Okay. Elias, some others. Um, and, of course, they had things like this. Silas. Um, trying to think of the names. <laughs> yes, and so they had, uh, they had things like this. And then also Joseph Smith's brother, uh, um, Hiram Smith's children, came out here. Oh. Hiram Smith's yeah. wife came out here. And they're, yeah, yeah. they're so lying. So Joseph Smith stayed. So at one mm. time, Joseph Smith uh, III was the president of the reorganized church, and his mm -hmm. cousin, his first cousin, Joseph F. Smith, was the president of the LDS church. And their first cousins. And their first cousins. We never running think about that. Competing conflicting churches that were both growing at the same time mm -hmm. and both continuing right. on at mm -hmm. the same time we never think about how close those relations at least i i don't maybe because i'm i'm not from a utah family right. i'm not from a pioneer family so probably i would bet utah families have maybe kind of more connection mm -hmm. to that yes it might it might just be me or people who are from convert families i, I should say i'm from a convert family so but this is a really so important uh, painting you can see that he's wearing different clothing mm -hmm. than he was in the two images I've shown you so far, the original and the copy. Uh, he's it's holding not. a Bible. Uh, we know that from some mm -hmm. of the other images by Maudsley. Mm -hmm. uh, Sutliff Maudsley always painted his subjects when he did their portraits. Mm -hmm. He painted them with their favorite book. And so when you go through all the different Maud, the known Maudsleys, mm -hmm. uh, each person has a special book. Joseph is mm -hmm. always painted with the Bible. He was the champion mm -hmm. of the Bible, not the Book of Mormon. Oh. Lucy. I didn't know that. 
is holding a Book of Mormon. Lucy is holding a Book of Mormon. Okay. And that book I found and uh, was acquired by a philanthropist who gave it to the church. This exact book yeah, in this I painting? I found it and, and the philanthropist paid me for it and it went to the church. How do you find these things? That came from the Smith family. That came okay. from her daughter, Catherine's descendants. Okay. And so it was an important, important copy of the book. But Lucy's painted always with the Book of Mormon. Joseph is mm -hmm. always with the Bible. Hiram is always painted with the Doctrine of Covenants. And when Hiram is painted with the Doctrine of Covenants, I made this, this uh, historical discovery, not just his portrait, but Hiram is always painted with the Doctrine of Covenants opened to uh, Roman numeral 80, which everybody might have thought was random, but it's actually today's section 89 in the Doctrine and Covenants. Hiram Smith's Doctrine and Covenants was open to section 89, the Word of Wisdom. That's what I was, yeah, was going to say. I think it's that's what And he, it was painted in 1842, and in 1842 he gave a long sermon in Nauvoo on the Word of Wisdom. He was the champion oh. of the Word of Wisdom, Hiram was. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. I would love to read that sermon to see, because we have our modern interpretations and I see people debating about what the word of wisdom was really trying to say. It seems to discourage meat, but then it seems to maybe not discourage, you know. There's a reason. But if, they're, if they no, have there's whole a whole okay. <laughs> I love this. I could talk about all this stuff for hours. The okay. word of wisdom is a compromised document. The word of wisdom is not mm -hmm. God's best um, instruction. I mean, it actually starts out and says, mm -hmm. this is a word of wisdom adapted to the weakest of the weak saints of anybody who can be called a saint or however that goes. Mm -hmm. And he essentially is taking the different camps or groups in Kirtland who, where there's infighting, there's shakers and other people and they don't want to eat meat and they, uh, others do. No, but. Joseph Smith wrote the word of wisdom as a compromise to bring the groups together and when you read it, it's, that's why it's confusing. It's actually deliberately hmm. confusing. It is actually oh. written so that you go, wait a minute, what does that mean? Not to be used except in times of winter, cold, and famine. That's not even grammatically. It's so confusing. <laughs> so, and it seems a little bit it sort of difficult tells, to only eat meat. Only, you know, I'm okay with actually reducing meat, but eating it only in those times is so kind of So he like, validates everybody. He's validating everybody. And he does it okay. with alcohol. He says, hmm. well, but... You know, <laughs> maybe something made with, you know, barley, <laughs> mild. The small beer, like his root beer, was a mild drink made from barley. Well, back then, I, this, I mean, that's a whole subject people really aren't, we don't know, we've lost this knowledge, but y you fermented, you fermented foods. You would yes, ferment yes, drinks. Yes. You would, alcohol would be one of tons of fermented and all different stages of fermentation. So it, back then it wasn't like there was alcohol and then there was soda and then there was Juice. Right. And we could talk for hours <laughs> about the Word of Wisdom. It's a great subject. And, you know, they're, obviously they were fermenting food to purify the food. And mm -hmm. beer was actually mm -hmm. safer to drink than water. There were people dying mm -hmm. from drinking any water out of a river. And they didn't understand sanitation, but the beer was actually fermented and then safe. Yeah, so or a root beer would probably purifying, be safer. Purifying for... the water, yeah. Right, because the live bacteria actually kills off any... Right. As, you from, as it ferments. So that's what you get with Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, Missouri, making, yeah. making Budweiser and Bud Light, is that they're taking that, that terrible river water, which was killing people, and they're creating beer out of it. There were I, Germans creating Czech beer, just like my ancestors did. In St. Louis? My ancestors did it in oh. Minnesota, but they were, they were doing the same thing. We were Czechs with a German crew of beer makers. Oh, That's oh! Back in the old was. world, yeah, they were yeah. they were also just trying to cleanse their own water. Yes, and yes. Uh -huh. This I you learn something new every day, and we could talk about that for ten more so hours. So that's an important image from Bathsheba. Cool. And I like that you know she's a woman, a female artist in Nauvoo. Okay, so this one is William Smith, Joseph's brother. Okay. And if you're familiar with. Hiram Smith and Joseph Smith, you can see that William Smith was actually like a cross between them. He had Joseph's mm. nose and he had Hiram's sideburns. And he was actually better looking than people realize he was because in photographs of him as in the 1880s, which I don't, we don't have a lot of early photographs of William, but we have a hard time understanding all of his philandering ways in Nauvoo and his womenizing activities in the 1840s and 1850s, but he was actually probably pretty good looking. And by the way, when we look at these Maudsley images, it looks good looking. the things that we consider to be fine attributes of handsomeness and beauty 
were different then. So I think the Smiths were perceived as very good looking at okay. the time. Their Roman and British features were, were assets. Even being portly was an asset because nobody wanted to look like they were poor. So yeah. the heavier you were, the more educated you must mm -hmm. be. Yeah, which is interesting how that swapped today. Mm -hmm. and Healthy then, food and then is this more expensive. Is, uh, William's wife, I should have had oh. this together. Okay. Hold this up. She's okay. actually a grant. Okay. She married a, oh. a, a grant of the Heber J. Grants. Okay. The Grants were one of the more early Mormon families mm -hmm. as well that have continued on. Mm -hmm. I particularly cool. like this one because, uh, of the, again, the, diff, the, the features of Joseph and Hiram blended together. I mm -hmm. like her simply because, mm -hmm. because again, Art by women and art of women is more rare, and it's very, very important. And is it you... more rare, or is it more rare that we focus on it? Both. Both. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think there were a lot of a lot of companion portraits like these in mm -hmm. that area era, and all the way through the Victorian even and even the Edwardian era of mm -hmm. the early 1900s. But um, that may have had to do with people being bankers or or. Um, industrialists, they would have their, the male would have a portrait made, and so there would be more, or anybody in leadership and government. So you'll have more portraits of Abraham Lincoln than his wife, but uh, there were a lot of people that had companion portraits made like this. Cool, Ugh, man, I have so many, she has a comb, she's wearing a comb in her well, hair. Well, look at the detail. Uh, <laughs> she, there's so much detail. Do you use reading glasses? Nope. Okay, but can you see all the detail in the lace and in the hair and the textiles, the tapestries, the curtains? Uh, Maudsley mm -hmm. was not a ordinary artist of that mm -hmm. time. He uh, was a documentary artist. He was painting these as if we had have a driver's license portrait mm -hmm. made. I mm -hmm. mean, people people carried these in their pockets. A lot of the Maudsleys that exist are folded and they have damage to them because they were in somebody's purse or wallet. Ah. Uh, these were uh, meant to be documentary. They were meant to be remem mem remembrances of what people actually looked like. Not okay. like the big oil painting of Joseph, where we uh, wanted to make him aristocratic and hang it on the wall. But here we wanted, this would be for, for their spouse to actually remember what they looked like. Oh. So these are documentaries. So the question yeah. of whether or not Maudsley accurately mm -hmm. painted Joseph Smith is yes. The answer is yes, he did. If anyone we, had, it would have been him. We know from putting it up against that death mask that he's mm -hmm. accurate. He put mm -hmm. Joseph up, Smith up against the wall, mm -hmm. and he did not seem to hide... Um, negative features. He put it all in there. Yep, this, and he was I mean, detailed, and he was a copyist. He was mm -hmm. a he was a pattern maker that could reproduce things. That was his specialty, is reproduction. Okay, and that's what I kind of gain from this is that's the impression I get is it it seems very real. Mm -hmm. So, so that's another right. Smith. Yeah. This is a portrait of the other member of the presidency that we kind of forget, William, William oh. Law. <laughs> okay. William Law. So, so Maudsley did mostly Smith family members, mm -hmm. and he did uh, other church leaders. He did very few for money. There were very few people that had any money in Nauvoo. Okay. And this is, a, what would this be? A riding crop. Okay. That was common. For some reason, you know, you didn't have a lot of physical assets in... Mm -hmm. Even in the 1840s, if you go back to like the 1600s, people would have a will and they would describe like, and I give my pewter plate to, you know, <laughs> they had almost nothing and yeah. they'd still put it in their will. But in, the, in this era, people are, and even in the earliest photography, people had a, like occupational portraits where they would have an object, either a book or a riding crop or, mm -hmm. you know, something of some value among the very few things you would own. And you would put it, put that in your picture, and there are cool. other, uh, other many others of, the, of that period. I think one of Emma has uh, the church owns one of Emma Smith, where she's holding one. Okay. All right. I'll try to go through these kind of quickly here. So. All right. This is an interesting, stern-looking man. That is. Uh, Sidney Rigdon. No. No. Okay. At uh, Parley Pratt. Lorenzo Snow. Oh, I don't know if I've seen a and younger picture. Nobody has. This is what? decades this, earlier the... than any picture of Lorenzo Snow known. Wow. And you see that he has, of all of Maudsley's portraits, he's the yeah. only person that Maudsley shaded. 
and people don't know this, but Ma, but Lorenzo Snow was Italian. Oh. His mother was Italian, and his sister Eliza is Italian. They oh. don't tell anybody that. Okay. Lorenzo Snow has brown eyes. What other Mormon prophet has brown eyes? I don't know. I've never thought about it. But. It was actually too early to have brown eyes and brown skin uh, and be a Mormon president and, with everybody having blue eyes in Utah. This one's interesting. I just okay. got this a week ago, and it actually has the same, it's as if somebody used the same uh, tempera or gouache mm -hmm. paints to do the background, very similar to his earlier portrait. I, he, I just, I feel like he looks like a painter or something. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> <He's> love <laughs> Lorenzo. I love his sister, but they were Italian mm -hmm. and they lived mm -hmm. in an Italian community mm -hmm. in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a story that they, they, they never told and nobody else has ever told. Uh. I've even seen one painting of him with blue eyes. Oh, <laughs> to try to kind of make him look more like how everyone else looked. Right. Did they like Jesus had blue eyes, right, from the Mediterranean. Right. Let's just, <laughs> we'll just change everyone to look like we look. Mm -hmm. One of the neat things about this portrait is that he never changed his hair. He did the mm -hmm. wave in his hair there that you oh, see in all of his portraits. I love that's that hairstyle. I mean, this that, looks, this guy looks like he could own a coffee shop right now. Like so this, that original, hair yeah. is some good hair. Original photographs of him that oh my match that top that he never wow. changed the wave on the top. Yeah. He's stylish. He got the bow tie mm -hmm. <laughs> as well. <laughs> That's such a, he doesn't totally look like he's younger to me. No, he's he's uh, more, he's got some baby fat there. Yeah, that makes sense. Or Maudsley, that's a good segue into another thing I want to talk about Maudsley. So this is a three quarter view of mm -hmm. Maudsley. Maudsley's specialty mm -hmm. was doing side portraits where he mm -hmm. stood you up against the wall. And okay. his skill level He's got different skills and mm -hmm. times have changed too. So the, today's perception of uh, perspective is very mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And Maudsley did not understand perspective at all. He okay. did understand how to create patterns, how to duplicate things and how to do detail. But his perspective of Lorenzo Snow's mm -hmm. face was perhaps not that good or Lorenzo mm. Snow just had some baby fat still. He's about 28 okay. in, that, in that portrait. Okay. And, and he thinned. He stayed thin oh, for the rest of his yeah, life. Yeah, I can see the perspective, too, in the coat, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit. There's... Mm -hmm. how, how do families feel about uh, giving up these? Do they like giving their artifacts to historians? Do they have different feelings? Have there been people who have said, well, you know, we'd rather keep it? Some do. Some recognize that. Uh, they're not best qualified to take care of it, and they actually would rather have it taken care of for uh, the benefit of future generations, make sure it gets preserved. Mm. They can't maybe take one item and divide it among multiple children. And they, they, if, it was, if you had a Maudsley, you might be interested in knowing that it went with a collection of Maudsleys that someday, whether by me or by somebody I sell it to, a philanthropist would be the only person I would sell it to, that would, it would end up going to a church or some other rare book library where they would all be together. Mm -hmm. So there's some comfort in knowing that it's gonna be put into acid-free materials. If you've got a, a small painting like this and it's just in a shoe box with mementos mm -hmm. and Christmas cards and things, you may right. understand that it- Or sitting in an attic where it gets hot in the summer offered, and cold in the winter and- Yeah, and you're offered $50,000 for it and you could send a, a child mm -hmm. or a grandchild to college with the money. Oh, right. <laughs> Maybe you know, do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Have you had anyone that's kept it though and said, we're gonna keep this? Almost everybody I talk to will sell. Oh, okay. Because of the message I share and the, you know, the whole acquisition and, and uh, for, for me the key is preservation mm -hmm. and then placement. The placement mm -hmm. is the last part, whether um, who it goes to, whether, I, whether the church buys it from me or whether a philanthropist buys it. The church doesn't buy very much, but mm -hmm. um, Somehow it will go to a, the church or somebody like it, Yale University, or somebody will take a donation. Someone who will mm -hmm. take good care of it. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought of doing, real quick, uh, a museum of your own, a small museum or something? That's or? what my children want to do. Okay. Yes. You might leave that to them. Might. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> to decide. <laughs> okay. Right now I have a museum in my home. That's just, you know, oh. a three-level home I live in by myself. So. Oh, okay. 
Okay, there's, your whole there's a lot your of, whole a lot of stuff on display. <laughs> oh gosh, I should have you talk to another uh, gentleman that I interviewed who was the art history uh, professor at Salt Lake Business College, mm -hmm. uh, Jim Go Goff. I don't know if mm -hmm. you've you, mm -hmm. you know, oh, okay, yeah. yeah, his house. He's collected stuff. He said he he wants really quick. This is totally off the subject, but he 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 showed me at his house. He has a whole chandelier. He got at DI for ten dollars, and it was like a two thousand dollars chandelier. And, yeah. He uh -huh. said, once you have the not, an eye, you yes. can. I shop at the eye. And, <laughs> oh my gosh. Almost every day. <laughs> really? <laughs> when I'm here, yes. What have you found at DI? Well, a first edition Mormon scripture. You have? Yeah, the DI people don't. <sighs> really? They, they kind of do. They have some cases and stuff. They do. They spot some things, but they often mm -hmm. throw things away if they find an incomplete book. The most valuable Mormon books always have pages missing. I mean, they throw away a book with missing pages. Oh. They, if they're moldy, they'll get a box of moldy books and they throw them away without looking. And they might be thousands mm -hmm. of dollars. Oh. And sometimes it's the opposite. And some, sometimes yeah. instead of being the moldy books, which they're throwing away, I found books that were 150 years old, critical Mormon books um, that were, I mean, crucial Mormon books. And they were in, they looked like they were mint condition. They were brand new looking. Wow. We and who the, knows? We don't use the word mint with books like you do with coins, but it looked yeah. it looked untouched and mm -hmm. was on the shelf with all the new new books and it was printed by the Latter day Saints in the eighteen fifties. So And they had no idea that no. they just put that right on their shelf. Mm -hmm. Yep. It was actually I think a dollar or something. Oh my goodness. So what do you when you're in that moment in the storage, do you just start jumping up and down in front of people or you just quietly grab it? Yes, both. That's <laughs> so quietly grab it and then jump up and, and down. And then jump up and down when you get home. Okay. So this is, uh, let me get I the I would be Mormons freaking open. out. I would publicly be freaking out if I, but, if I, mean, I it found doesn't something happen every like day. that. I'm telling you stories after 40 years of doing this. So, yeah. you know, none of these great discoveries happen every day. It's a lot of work. And you don't mm -hmm. know how many times I've been told by somebody they had a first edition Mormon hymnal or first edition Doctrine and Covenants or something and they sounded credible. And mm -hmm. they knew their they knew their Mormon history, and I talked to them about the features of the book mm -hmm. and everything. And I got on a plane and flew across the country, and they didn't have what they purported uh, that they had. Or so it wasn't what they thought. It's very very hard. Okay. So again, this is Lorenzo Snow. This is his sister, and they're actually mm -hmm. different sized, but they're sort of companion portraits in that they're um, made with the exact same uh, gouache background and so on. Oh. Now this one of. Eliza R. Snow is mm -hmm. as good as Maudsley gets. This is Eliza R. Snow. Yes. Oh, she's famous in sister. Mormonism. Yes. She's 10 years older than her brother. Okay. Uh, she should be about uh, 38 in this photo, in this portrait. And okay. this, this painting, uh, it's not his most skilled painting because, again, he does the three-quarter view and he doesn't mm -hmm. understand perspective. And, but yet this painting exemplifies all of the particular features that Maudsley is good at. He was a pattern maker in England, and so he does a lot of work that typical painters of the period didn't do. He does more in the carpet, the hat, the detail in the hat, the wood grain on the table, uh, the curtains, the, the detail in her hair and in her hair ornament there, mm -hmm. and in her face. She again has a mm -hmm. tanner face than any other Maudsley other than her brother. And so Maudsley really works hard on those details. Other portrait painters uh, might have been a little bit better at perspective, but they are very, very, they don't spend as much time as he did. Hmm. That's interesting. The two, the women so far look like each other to me. Her hairstyle is, and as a matter of fact, this painting is identified on the back as Emma Smith by the family, by recent oh. family, like in the 1950s. It oh. looks so much like Emma that people, Yeah. They, but people say that Joseph kind of liked both. Eliza and Emma, so maybe they weren't too different in their looks. That's another subject, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so how did you know like this? like brunettes. That's, how did you know that this is Eliza or Snow? Well, we don't 100% know. We're 90% sure because of the Italian and the, uh, oh. just all the features and the period and knowing the types of people that Maudsley did and you kind of had to narrow it down. There weren't any other, um, people that looked like her. This is a, a unique, okay. beautiful look. Oh, that's amazing. 
It's interesting too. They wear a lot of dark colors. It kind of remind. It's mm-hmm. kind of reminds me of the Amish I've seen mm-hmm. um, in Kentucky. Where I mean, I know they intentionally stick with dark colors, but mm-hmm. I wonder if that developed because I'm sure back then the most affordable colors were probably gray and dull. And, and Boy, if you could afford the, to dye things, that probably would The fashion would've... magazine suggests that they were very bright colors mm-hmm. and that even Joseph wore very mm-hmm. bright colors oh. and a white hat. I mean, they were very flamboyant in their dress. I think oh. what we might be seeing is that they wore their most formal clothes for their portrait. Oh, So they may have okay. had clothes of all colors and then put on their dark black or dark blue for their Oh, portrait. and that was considered more formal. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Their church clothes. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. You would want your to put your best foot forward. Right. So when you see all the detail that I keep talking about in... When you see all the detail mm-hmm. that I keep talking about in the portraits that Maudsley did, Ma- Maudsley was a uh, calico pattern maker from uh, Lancashire, Lancashire, England. And he, um, as a very young boy, had... had somebody noticed him doing some trick paintings and so they hired him as a maybe a 10 year old to go work in the textile mills and yeah. copy patterns um, that could be carved and then printed on calico and so mm-hmm. they they were printing cloth like this for curtains tablecloths and things in england and that was the first time of, that they were printing right and you could buy something that was with... a big part of the big industrial revolution so <laughs> maudsley okay. was part of that and very oppressed child mm-hmm. uh, child labor yeah. But at least he was, was a child say, labor artist. <laughs> yeah, that's better than uh, other things. But he learned to do all of these. About. Yeah, he learned to do all these details that you see then in his work because he's oh. able to copy. He's a copyist mm-hmm. and so he's able to make one portrait of Joseph Smith mm-hmm. and then make others from it. And mm-hmm. then you also see that uh, early experience when he uh, goes into the details on the curtains and the carpeting. Yeah, which makes sense that later he in incorporated that in his portrait work because he started right. as a copyist. He, right. And he started as a detail. It, detail was probably important. Detail, right. So he ended up with different traits than a lot of portrait right. painters right. probably did. And do you do you put these covers on here? Or I did do. someone I a, else? No, I have, a, I have a professional that makes those for me. Somebody oh, very okay. skilled. It's got a leather interior. What? Mm-hmm. Tell me how you choose these materials and down to like the plastic. Well, it's a collaboration between, the plastic is a mylar, so it's mm-hmm. acid free, and it's really just to keep us from spitting on it. <laughs> okay. It's the, it's the COVID mask of, over the painting. Okay, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's, but it's acid free mylar, not all plastic is acid free, so that's a mylar, mm-hmm. um, it's not petroleum based. It's so especially it's, order mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Everything else is considered to be um, the, this this is probably acid free, but of course leather isn't. Leather leather is tanned, but it's it's like a book and it's protected by the mylar. Okay, so the most important protective element is the plast, the mylar, and then the rest of this is kind of more for looks. Right, and, and this is a transitive uh, type uh, preservation. Ultimately, mm-hmm. this will be uh, perhaps presented in a different way. It could be framed on a wall of a of a museum, but this is a way mm-hmm. that I can prepare these to travel with them and. Show them. Safely and mm-hmm. without damaging them. Yep. So these are two Maudsley uh, self-portraits. And I explained how he doesn't... I brought a number of three-quarter views, but that isn't a specialty. He does the portraits mm-hmm. like he does of Joseph. But he did do this he novel did. period. That's actually Maudsley himself. Yeah. And then this is Maudsley later in life, about <gasps> 20 years later. Whoa. Interesting. Very different, but very the same. But well, I he can did do see himself this... in three-quarter view because mm-hmm. he couldn't put himself up against the wall and trace himself. Well, okay, <laughs> right. Okay, so he had, did he do it in a mirror then probably? How would he I, do it? I believe this one to be to have been done by uh, from a photograph and this one was probably done by okay. a mirror. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, because early on he probably attempted it mm-hmm. and and then when he had the photograph he was able to do better copy mm-hmm. kind of work. This, this yep. is... Interesting. I, I feel like, it, to me, I, I'm like this very Abraham Lincoln looking, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- that's the period. It's about 1865. I don't know yeah. if, if Abraham Lincoln made it cool to look, have a certain look or something. I think the beards came in uh, earlier about, uh, in, 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 about 1850. Okay. And maybe Abraham Lincoln had a popular look. He did. He would have, yes. And, so. and he had a... Uh, 
Yes, in order to get elected. Yeah. <laughs> He's a politician. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> but right. he had, uh, but he had photographs made too before. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, Abraham Lincoln was photographed about the same time that the uh, Nauvoo people were photographed. Like Emma Smith is photographed in 1845. And Abraham Lincoln is photographed for the first time in 1845, and the Nauvoo mm. Temple is photographed in 45 or 46. Oh. So that's the rival of photography in Illinois. Even though it was invented in 1839 in France, it took some time to, you know, arrive in New York City, and then people to train additional photographers and get the equipment and have it travel west to Illinois. This one is is mm -hmm. a, as good as any. Ah. This is Emma. And this is her son, and they're at the grave site, we believe, of Joseph Smith. Oh my gosh! Wow! And again, look at all the detail in her hair and her and the boy, uh, his dress. Wow! And this is a very oh, and he's brightly colored, actually. Yes. So that's the more typical bright colors that I see when I see fashion books and por other portraits from the period. And she's but she's more looks mor mourning. She's carrying. Yeah. She's out. She's outside. Mm -hmm. It may be the only Maudsley portrait from outside. No, no, there's one of Joseph mm -hmm. and Hiram's. No, there's, there's two of Joseph and Hiram in front of the temple. Maybe three. Mm -hmm. Sorry. But rare, rare for Maudsley to do outside portraits. So would he probably have had her inside with the shadow and he would trace her? And like you said, so he had his original and then he would put different exactly. backgrounds. and because different. Because she's actually, the Church uh, History Museum has another portrait of her that's well, it's different. He's actually changed her hair and her, even her weight, I think, is a little bit different. Her weight looks a little different, yeah, than Some have what said she was think. pregnant in this portrait. Uh, okay. She did have a, she was pregnant mm -hmm. when Joseph Smith died. Oh. Uh, she had a posthumous child named David Hiram Smith. Okay. So she may have been pregnant in this portrait. Wow, that is an amazing moment that is captured, just very dramatic moment in history and in her, in that person's life, in her life. That's beautiful. <laughs> so the book that he's holding is a Mormon book. It's a okay. it's a little uh, reference. It's the first Mormon reference book, printed in 1842. <gasps> oh wow! And so you can see the little clasp. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh! Wow. That's okay. printed in Philadelphia in 1842, and it's sort of like a a topical concordance to. Um, the Bible with mm -hmm. the, all the different popular mm -hmm. Mormon proof texts. Is, it, is there a reprint of this anywhere? This is the that first book I ever reprinted. I reprinted this book in, 18, in 1982. I was a teenager. Okay. I feel like a lot of people would like to actually look through that. So there's the title page. Wow, Holy Scriptures and Concordance, which Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to which is added as an appendix, an epitome of epitome, of epitome, e epitome? Okay. of ecclesiastical history, etc. It's amazing. So you see that that That's continuing theme of putting a rare book. Mm -hmm. what, well, it's now a rare book. Yeah. In each portrait. Wait, that has Emma Smith's name on it. The box, yes, that came from the family. It, it's this. It's this book. D it's literally this book. We think, yes, because this portrait came through the family and the book came through the family. Oh my goodness. And that was, was that really Emma's book? And we know book? that each, yes. <laughs> I just held Emma Smith's book in my hand. Oh my gosh. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that. I just need to hold this up. These are, these are, these people are famous in, in, uh, in this religion. So, <laughs> wow. I feel very lucky right now. Well, this one really trumps that. So this okay. is one of her hymn books. Oh, wow. This is the second most valuable Mormon book. And did they have those, those, those boxes? They kept no, their I boxes in boxes? No, I get all boxes? these made. Oh, okay. Yeah, all oh, these this... are made like the painting boxes. They're all made by the, like, Oh, you made this. Yes, this box is outside the book. Oh, okay. I was going to say, did they have that print back then? No, I put her like name that? on it so okay. that it doesn't get confused with my other copies. I yes. see. I'm, I thought this this whole thing was And then it has paperwork original. with it. So when I buy a rare book, it mm -hmm. travels with paperwork like a pedigree. Okay. They call it provenance. Wow. So this is just as, as good as it gets. This is the first Latter-day Saint hymnal. And so it's much rarer than a first edition Book of Mormon. There were 5,000 copies of the first edition Book of Mormon. There were probably only 200 of these. Oh, to my put it in goodness. Perspective. And there are today 
maybe 350 copies of the first edition Book of, no Book of Mormon known by okay. my census, but there's only, well, there was only six copies until I discovered a few. Of but, the hymn book? Yes. Left. Six copies in private hands. Yeah. <gasps> so this is one of them. It has a, what we call a treed sheep on it. They made it look like walnut burl, like you might see on the dashboard of a nice Lexus. Okay, yeah. And the book has, you know, the title page from Kirtland, Ohio. And so it has the, the music without notes. I'll let you hold that one and I'll kind of go quickly then. Oh I'm going to go through gosh. five editions of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the first five editions of the Book of Mormon I brought. This is so cute. And it has a little handwriting right here. 1835. There's an original label. Some collectors would take that off and try to make the book look like it looked in 1835. But I actually like that conservator's label that somebody added. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, oh, this was a conservator that added Yeah, that this. wouldn't have been original. Oh. It actually very faintly says LDS hymns on the in gold oh, okay. gilt on the spine. I can see that. Oh, wow. And but that label was probably little... added in 19, you know, what, what is this inscription here? It says, the, this book was found in an old desk when I took up the business of Delta Marshall in 1866. Uh, Palmsville, Ohio or something. It's Painesville, Ohio. It's a town right next to Kirtland where all the anti-Mormons lived. Oh, and okay. so this book is probably, that label on the back is probably from about 1865 then. Oh, wow. Okay, we got to keep moving. Yep. I could just stare at it. <laughs> I love women, so I liked the, mm -hmm. you know, this book. I like the painting. I like the fact mm -hmm. that Emma is the author of the hymn book. Mm -hmm. And this is a first edition book of Mormon. Very few were owned by men. And so I actually value and will pursue more vigorously to get a book owned by a woman. Any Mormon book owned by a woman, used by a woman, is more valuable to me than... That's not true with a, uh, probably with any other collector, but because I'm more interested in... Women didn't own books as often, mm -hmm. you're saying? Right. The family would own the book? Mm -hmm. The family would own the book. And, you know, we know where Brigham Young's Book of Mormon is. We know Hiram Smith's Book of Mormon is. I've, I've discovered and acquired those, too. Mm. But this is, this is a copy that belonged to Brigham Young's wife. And so that, to me, is a real treasure. This is also mm -hmm. a little different from other copies of the first edition in that this was one of the remainders. So when they made a contract to print and bind 5,000 copies for $3,000 in 1830, mm -hmm. They, or 1828, they, they always did an overrun, but they bound exactly 5,000, and so there were some leftover sheets that they took to Kirtland, and this copy was bound in Kirtland, Ohio, and it has an extra index in it that they uh, printed in Kirtland and added to the book, re-familiarizing myself with the book. Anyway, it's mm -hmm. Susan Snively Young's copy. She was, she's buried right next to Brigham here mm. in Salt Lake City. Which wife was she? <laughs> Is she the first <laughs> wife, or? No. Oh, okay, so one of his rather high number But she of must have been educated. She collected rare books. Yeah, I She wasn't that. in the church in 1830. She acquired that book probably out here in Utah. Mm -hmm. I need to stop smelling these. There it is. I was trying to find an index <laughs> there. So they've tucked an index. They call references in the front of the book here. That's mm -hmm. really rare. That index alone doubles the value of any first edition Book of Mormon. Because? Because most copies don't have it. Only about... 2% of the copies have it. Why, did, why didn't they have it? It's printed later in Kirtland, and so it generally appears in copies bound mm. in Kirtland, or it's tipped mm. into copies uh, during the Kirtland period. Wow, oh, I have so many questions branching off So that's these, the first edition. I don't have time. And this is the, I could talk for an hour mm -hmm. just about how that book was produced. This is the Kirtland edition. The Kirtland okay. edition is printed in Kirtland, Ohio in 1837. So mm -hmm. seven years later, they ran out of copies and rushed to get a copy out. They uh, printed it with a explanation in the back and also a long preface. And the preface describes how Joseph and Oliver sat down with the original manuscript from the first edition, the printer's manuscript from the first edition, and a copy of the first edition and uh, made corrections. They made thousands mm -hmm. of corrections. Oh. And Oliver Cowdery made a thousand corrections on the fly. He actually printed the book. So his name appears mm -hmm. on the title page as the printer here. Mm -hmm. The publishers are Parley P. Pratt and John Goodson. But Oliver Cowdery was the printer himself and the binder for these books. He owned, oh, the, he owned wow. the bindery. So he made on the fly on his own volition about a thousand typographical improvements. But he and Joseph made s several thousand significant improvements to the book. So yeah, a lot of people I'm don't know protecting that. yeah the text of the book to see how this evolved to get 
our modern text. Yeah, that, I think a lot of people would be fascinated to read that very, very first copy. So that Kirtland that. Book of Mormon, you know, is, is printed and bound in conjunction with the hymnal. They're printed ah, together. And they look great together. They do. <laughs> and they kind of almost are similar to our, today we have a, you know, sure. I have a set that's about this sure. small like this. I see you're not putting that hymnal back in the box. You're, oh, I'm you're sorry, gonna, where no, was that's it? okay. You can, where was it? I thought maybe you wanted to look at it again. Oh, <laughs> okay, I didn't. <laughs> I thought you were gonna keep that one out. <laughs> no, no, sorry. I'm gonna sneak it into my bag. This is another book that belonged to a woman. This mm. is, a, John Taylor owned the mm. print shop and bindery in Nauvoo, mm -hmm. Illinois. And so this is the third edition of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And John Taylor, um, gave that book to his new wife, Jane. This particular edition is printed by Joseph Smith's brother. So the first edition was printed commercially by Grandin. The second was published by, or printed by Oliver Cowdery. And the third edition was printed by uh, Don Carlos Smith. All three of those men died from the health effects of being printers. Oh. They're young. Oh, wow. They all three died. The, the printers of the first three editions of the Book of Mormon died as a result of printing the Book of Mormon. That's, they gave their life for it because right. <laughs> of the toxic, whatever right. they were using mm -hmm. was probably mm -hmm. horribly to toxic. Um, November, what is, was, was this original or says? That came with the book, the family put that in. I don't oh, okay. think it's um, it was probably later. integral to the book. Okay, that's amazing. But the end papers are, this is one of only two copies in existence bound in red. It's just mm -hmm. especially bound for John Taylor's wife. Wow. Amazing. Okay, and then this one was owned by Joseph Smith. Oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> this one really he printed lucky. himself. So the first edition was printed by Grandin. It was commercial. They hired okay. Grandin locally in Palmyra. The second was printed by Oliver Cowdery. So it's the first one the church did. And he's the translate. I mean, he's the scribe for the translation process. And then the third one's done by Joseph's brother, Don Carlos. And then this mm -hmm. one is actually printed by Joseph Smith. Oh my goodness. Are you sure I can touch this? Yeah, I'll, I'll, hold it a second. And then in okay. the front, it says that it was <laughs> given to a newspaper reporter named John Whitcomb by the author. Oh, okay. He gave it away. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was doing his missionary work, probably. Yeah. Well, what would happen oh. is Joseph would have his books in his home in the mansion mm -hmm. house in Nauvoo. And a visitor would come. And if you were... Influ an influencer, what we call today an influencer. Okay. You got to stay at the mansion house with Joseph. If you had Emma. an Instagram account and you had so many followers, right. you could so, stay with yeah, Joseph. If you were a newspaper reporter <laughs> or you were a, a, a minister from another faith or you were a politician, you mm -hmm. would frequently stay at the Smith house. And then if you said, I'd like a copy of the Book of Warman, he'd just say, well, here, take mine. I'll get another one tomorrow at the print shop. Ah. And so he'd give his, he'd just a frequently he'd just gave give his the books one away. He, was he gave using. away Emma Smith's books too. Oh, really? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sounds annoying. I can see why she would so, be annoyed. So where there's 5,000 copies of the first edition, Joseph mm -hmm. himself printed this edition and he only printed 600 copies. Oh my it's gosh. Like his, it's like his signature work. It's like he sealed his testimony by printing just a few himself at the very end. It's the last sort of authorized edition. Um, this is a real deal. If it, wasn't a, if it wasn't scripture, you would call it the author's edition, I guess you'd call it. Mm. And how many of those exist probably? Out of 600, probably 20. Wow. Yeah, so I'll let you hold that. <laughs> <laughs> and he just hands it over to me. <laughs> Given to John by the author. John Whitcomb, who may, may not have been a LDS. Would, would not have been, probably. Yeah, probably I think not. he was an Iowa newspaper reporter. Ah, this feels really special. I really appreciate being able to look at this. I can see all the all the same text that I've been very familiar with. It's not changed very much. Now, he made thousands of changes between the first and second. Now, I want to underscore that it's mostly mm -hmm. typographical, the addition of commas and correcting of grammar and things like that. Okay. Comparing the original to the manuscript and making sure that it conformed to the manuscript, but also becoming more typographically correct yeah. and grammatically correct. I would think so. There I would, are a few I mean, doctrinal changes uh, that bother some people and don't bother others. But then when he went from 
that Kirtland edition or the Nauvoo edition, he only mm -hmm. made um, just a handful of changes, maybe 40 changes mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, third edition to the, from the second edition to the third edition. And this is the fourth and he made zero changes. Oh, there okay. are no changes between 1840 and 1842. So he's probably pretty satisfied with right. this. With so that's where kind of like, it's actually my favorite edition. Oh, that's so amazing. And then finally, in between, they took the book to England and they printed a sort of an anglicized edition. So this is a, the fifth of the five editions that are printed by uh, the Latter-day Saints on, while Joseph Smith was alive. But this was Maudsley's copy. Oh, And guess okay. what he drew in the book? Joseph Smith? Joseph Smith. <laughs> he drew this again from life. This is probably done before any of his paintings. It's two oh. color, it's both black and brown. Okay. And it's signed. It's Joseph signed. Jeez. So that's oh an original gosh. portrait of Joseph Smith, probably the earliest known image of Joseph. I'm holding this in my hand. <laughs> I feel, I feel very lucky. And just to show you how good Maudsley is, this is another artist's rendition of Joseph in mm -hmm. Nauvoo. Uh, that looks like an Egyptian hieroglyph <laughs> to me. <laughs> it looks very different. It's Is labeled, that what you're saying? It's labeled Joseph Smith in pencil on the top, and then on the bottom, uh -huh. it's pen. It says Mormon prophet of Nauvoo. Huh. I just wanted it's to put in perspective different. that Maudsley, Maudsley actually is, is fairly skilled. He's a little, mm -hmm. struggles a little bit with perspective, but he's actually a very uh, well-trained yeah. artist. This almost looks like Joseph's brother, the good-looking one that they were <laughs> talking about. Like, I, if, I mean, if they, this yeah. was some, this was someone who was passing through, you said, or? This artist would be passing through to, passing through. to, to draw mm -hmm. Joseph. Oh. oh, that's so amazing. Cool. <laughs> so those are my best Maudsleys and my All right. five editions of the Book of Mormon. Thank you so much. Hymnal. That's amazing. I did not know that we were going to be, I didn't know you were going to bring such amazing things over. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I I'll just say. I've been for hours. I've had so many ventures, adventures mm -hmm. like rescuing sunstones from Nauvoo. Oh That's my gosh. That's a whole episode right there. Yes. Because I, it, oh, you know about it? No, no, no. Oh. oh. Uh, that's a whole episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not. It's I'm, a whole episode, yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I'll just say thank you so much for coming. And You're I just, welcome. I feel, I don't know, I kind of feel special and blessed that I got a chance to look at these, so. Good. Me too. So thank you so much, John, for being on the podcast. And what is your what is a website people can go and see your research and, and what you're doing? Mormonism.com is my main Mormon history website. Okay. And and what can they what are, can they see there right now if they go? Well, it's actually a site I use to acquire to let people know that I'm interested. And I have oh, okay. sort of a portfolio of different things that I've purchased there. Okay. So it's it's more if someone would like to reach out to you to contact yes, you. Yes, I do purpose. more interpersonal things. Uh, my websites are pretty old, but I plan on redeveloping. Okay, so websites. so you haven't compiled your you know with articles and stories. No, the website's any... 1996. I probably owned 25,000 items back then, and now I own 250,000, so 10 times okay. as much. And I'm just completely overwhelmed right. and oh. don't spend a lot of time on the internet. I spend more time. Okay. That's Meeting probably good. People, yeah. <laughs> you spend time in person with people actually talking to them? Right, exactly. Wow. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for being on the podcast and uh, hope to have you back. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs>